So to start off um, and to, to tell you a little bit um, of where we are coming from and why we are so interested in pancreatic cancer, I'd like to tell you a few facts about pancreatic cancer first. Uh, what you see here are statistics from the United States of America, but the numbers that are displayed here are very similar for Europe as well. And uh, in the top half of this slide, what you see um, is the incidence of cancers in males and females as they are measured every year. So the number of new cases um, of different types of cancer that appear in the US, and like I said, the numbers are very much the same in Europe. And you'll see that pancreas is not at the very top. Pancreatic cancer is not at the very top of this list. Um, it only comes in uh, number 10 in males as well as in females with uh, something like 22,000 new cases in the US. But uh, below, in the half below of this slide, um, what you see here is the numbers of deaths that result from different types of cancers um, in the US. And you see that pancreas cancer has moved up quite a bit. It's the fourth leading cause of cancer-related deaths in industrialized countries. And the reason for that is um, that Virtually every patient who is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer will eventually die from this disease and will die rapidly from this disease. And uh, this is a slightly different view of the same, um, of the same fact. I'm here now with numbers from Cancer Research UK. And what you see displayed here is over the last 30 years, um, the development of incidence and mortality of pancreatic cancer. Uh, so in dashed lines here, you see the incidence. So again, this is the number of new cases that appear every year of pancreatic cancer in Great Britain in this, uh, in this case. And uh, the solid lines are the numbers of deaths that result from pancreatic cancer um, in this same year. And as you see, um, the same fact here, virtually every patient who is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer will also die of the disease. And sadly, this situation has not really changed over the last 30 years. Uh, the incidence for males has gone slightly down. Um, this is an effect that we don't have any good explanation for. But our means of treatment of this disease really haven't changed and haven't improved. And what is the reason for this, or what are some of the reasons for this uh, horrible prognosis? The first one is the anatomical location of the pancreas. Um, if you look for the pancreas, you'll have to see, or you have to look here very deep in the abdomen, um, of people, so um, hidden beneath uh, the stomach here, behind, uh, uh, behind the liver, behind uh, part of the large intestine. And here's a um, slightly more focused view of the pancreas in, in very close contact with large blood vessels. Um, so a difficult area uh, to get to and a difficult area um, to do anything uh, surgery-wise, for example. Um, and this is also the reason why diagnostics are, or part of the reason why diagnostics are very difficult in pancreatic cancer. Um, typically, patients only come to the clinic very late during the course of the disease and with uh, symptoms that are not very specific. Uh, so jaundice, abdominal, abdominal or back pain, those are typical symptoms that uh, patients first present with. And uh, pancreatic cancer is not the first uh, disease that you think of when a patient comes um, with these types of uh, symptoms. And then uh, what's typically done there is radiologic imaging in the diagnostic workup of these patients. And uh, this is one um, example of an MRT of a 70-year-old uh, patient with a pancreatic head tumor. And um, I'm by no means an expert in uh, radiologic imaging, but I think you can appreciate that it might be difficult um, to, uh, to see or to accurately diagnose something in this area where there's a lot of different structures uh, to be discerned. And in this case, the diagnosis was pretty clear because there is already um, a uh, metastasis in the liver here that's clearly discernible. Um, so um, the diagnosis of a malignant process is very clear. But t just taking um, the picture here of the MRT itself uh, in the pancreatic head region, it is not easy uh, to distinguish between something that is a malignant tumor and something that may just be the result of um, an inflammatory process. And that's exactly um, the most difficult um, diagnostic problem that we are facing when pancreatic cancer pa or when uh, patients with a suspect pancreatic mass come to the clinic. Uh, the differentiation between something that is just part of an inflammation and something that is a um, malignant process is very difficult in a lot of cases. And um, the result, or one of the results of this situation are um, that when 
patients come to uh, to the clinic and these patients are too advanced um, to really do anything about the tumor anymore. Um, the second large problem that we have in the care for this patient is that we don't have any chemotherapy that's effective and there are no targeted therapies that are effective. So the only means of really um, helping these patients is an operation, the surgical removal of the tumor, but that is only possible in about 5 to 22% uh, percent of the patients depending on the center and depending on the study that you read. And um, these are going to uh, the surgery for a resection, an attempt of curative resection of the tumor. Um, but the, the vast majority of these patients also relapse with the tumor within very short time frames. And only between 5 and 36% of the few patients that even went to resection are disease-free after two years. Um, so it's clear uh, since surgery and surgery at an early stage is the only hope for cure that we can currently offer patients with pancreatic cancer, that there is um, a dire need for timely and uh, for accurate diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. Because um, on the one hand, you don't want to be too late with performing surgery on the patient, but on the other hand, of course, a total removal of the pancreas is a drastic operation and uh, you don't want to uh, do this to a patient who uh, later turns out was only suffering from a chronic pancreatitis, so a chronic inflammation of the organ. So one step um, in the diagnostic workup of um, patients with a suspect mass in the pancreas is often a fine needle aspiration biopsy. Um, so um, under the control of endosonography, a needle, as you can appreciate here, is advanced into the tumor and uh, material is aspirated um, from the tumor and then expelled onto a microscope slide. And then a pathologist uh, takes these slides um, under the microscope and tries to determine if there is uh, any sign of malignantly transformed cells in this aspirate. And if he sees a picture like this, then the diagnosis is pretty clear. There's uh, clear evidence for uh, transformed cells in this aspirate. But uh, pretty often the picture looks more like this, um, so completely acellular uh, material that's being um, harvested by the aspiration process there. And there's no way of telling um, if there is really any sign of malignant transformation in an aspirate like that. And so as a result, even in very experienced centers, the accuracy of diagnosis using final aspiration cytology is really below 80%. Uh, with the biggest problem being false negative results or uh, non-diagnostic results. So our idea here was um, to, in addition to the traditional uh, means of diagnosis, um, use residual material from these analyses and to perform molecular analyses on these. And uh, so we wanted to look at RNA profiles or RNA expression in molecular samples harvested in this way. And uh, what we started out with um, several years ago was first a technology uh, known as cDNA arrays. Um, so uh, the principle here is that uh, we spotted um, cDNAs of genes that we thought would be uh, beneficial in, for a differential diagnosis onto a nylon membrane carrier material here. And uh, the genes that we selected came from our own high-throughput analyses, as well as from different sources of uh, literature and uh, databases on the web. And we selected, uh, or we produced these cDNA arrays with 588 features. Um, as you can appreciate here, every feature is represented as a double spot. Uh, this does not really mean that we had 588 different genes um, because there's also control spots in there and genes that are represented by more than one uh, spot on the array. Um, and in the end, um, it turned out after all, we did all the analyses that about 169 genes were um, suitable for um, differentiation, for diagnosis. And what we did was uh, to take um, 62 pancreatic tissue samples, and uh, they were from ductal adenocarcinomas, so the most aggressive type of pancreatic tumor, and um, the differential diagnosis, the most difficult one, so chronic pancreatitis samples. 
And um, they were both from surgically resected samples, but also from fine needle biopsies, because that's our end goal, to be able to do a diagnosis um, on biopsy samples. And we divided uh, this set of 62 samples into a training set that we analyzed first. So 42 samples, and we did all the um, uh, MRI, mRNA profiling analyses uh, with the cDNA array that we just created. And then we had uh, the help of bioinformaticians, uh, without whom, of course, an analysis like this is not possible. They performed principal component analyses uh, for those who are interested in the, in the details. Uh, came up with 30 principal components that were able to separate um, our diagnostic samples. Um, and a linear combination of these principal components that produced a perfect separation, so a perfect uh, um, diagnosis or diagnostic uh, uh, differentiation between malignant tumors and the uh, control samples of chronic pancreatitis. And this was called our linear classifier. And then, of course, we took this classifier to see um, if, there was, uh, if this really had relevance in the real world, tested it on the remaining 20 samples that had never been part of the training of this uh, classifier and saw that also for these samples, um, the diagnostic accuracy was excellent, with 95% diagnostic accuracy producing one false positive, as you can see here, uh, falling on the wrong side of the cutoff. Uh, so a pretty encouraging result. Um, but we wanted more, we wanted to go further, because um, in the pancreas or in the, in the area of the pancreas, um, you can not only have the ductal adenocarcinomas uh, that we had been working on until then and uh, differentiate them from inflammatory masses, so from chronic pancreatitis, but there's other types of tumors that can arise in that area and we want to be able to differentiate, um, to accurately differentiate between all these different tumor types, between all these different entities in a single step. And uh, so we tried if our um, diagnostic cDNA array would also be suitable to do that and how well it would perform, uh, perform in that situation. And uh, to cut a very long story short, um, this is the end result. Um, these are uh, the different entities and uh, the color codes here um, are trying to indicate uh, the success rates that we have in using the cDNA array to accurately distinguish or to accurately um, put every single sample in its correct box, not, si not simply saying malignant or inflammatory, but instead also saying, okay, this is an ampullary carcinoma, this is an SPT, so a solid papillary tumor, or this is um, a ductal adenocarcinoma. And we have a success rate of more than 85% of hitting the exact right um, entity with this procedure. And the differentiation between malignant and benign or malignant and inflammatory is even higher at 93%, so still very, uh, very encouraging. Um, the only problem, so to speak, with this approach is that the cDNA approach, cDNA array approach, is uh, really a very, um, let's say, uh, it's uh, um, a technology that's not easily accessible for labs, uh, and a technology that takes um, a lot of um, um, material and a lot of uh, um, machinery that's not readily available. Um, in a lot of labs. So our idea was to now take um, the results that we had produced and transfer this diagnostic principle to a, a more user-friendly platform. And what we came up with was the idea of uh, transferring them to the Techman Low Density Array platform, or the Techman cards as they are now called, I think. Um, and our idea behind this was we wanted to uh, even select or more highly select the set of genes that we wanted to look at because from a mathematical standpoint fewer genes means um, easier uh, and more reliable uh, diagnosis. Uh, we were hoping for a greater dynamic range of gene expression that we can measure with um, a real-time PCR based method instead of a cDNA array based method. More sensitive detection um, and um, one of the most important reasons, faster analysis, because um, the cDNA array analysis as performed by us is based on radioactive labeling of samples 
and we had exposure times of up to five days before we can actually assess um, the mRNA profiles. And of course, uh, the Tecman Array cards, for those of you who have already worked with them, you know that they're very easy to handle and it's very easy to standardize um, the results and the tests using this card system. So we set out uh, together with um, Astrid Ferlins and Simone Günther from Applied Biosystems to try and establish this. Uh, so we produced uh, uh, specialized um, Tecman Array cards using 88 of our genes that we selected from our previous um, analyses and eight controls um, that were also on the cards. So 96 uh, genes in, in total, corresponding to two um, um, loading ports on the Tecman Array card. And uh, we took tumor aspirates, uh, we performed RNA extraction, we um, did the cDNA uh, uh, reverse transcription using random primers at this stage. Um, we included a pre-amplification step because the material that you get from uh, fine needle aspirates is, is of course very small. And um, then we did the Tecman low density array analyses. And the first question that we asked was, is this really suitable in our system? Uh, meaning, uh, can we get reliable results from the small amounts of material that we, uh, that we have to work with? And um, the, the pre-amplification step that we have to employ to get to good values, does this distort our results? So is there any bias introduced? Um, and we didn't want to take the word of the company for this, uh, so we tried uh, this out by ourselves. And the results were actually very encouraging. Um, what is plotted here is simply um, a cDNA pool that we used. And on the left-hand side, the two darker bars, uh, these always signify um, genes or uh, samples that were not pre-amplified. And uh, the brighter bars, these is this, this is the same pool, diluted and then uh, pre-amplified. Uh, normalized to the housekeeping genes that we have on the array and then the resulting relative expression values are very, very similar to each other. Um, and if you um, blow up the scale a little more here to look at the lower expressed genes as well, you can see that this is true for a wide range um, of expression values. So we never see or we never saw any, uh, any great distortion um, of the uh, expression profiles through um, the pre-amplification procedure. And when you perform the same analysis uh, with the same pool on a different day, the result is exactly the same. So it's a very stable system. So we were happy about that. And uh, we went on to see if this also holds true, not only for cDNA pool, but for real world samples uh, from patients, final biopsy samples. And it does. This is a comparison here always between um, a full biopsy that we had and um, the remainder, the needle flush out that we usually have uh, to work with. And you can see here that the results for a full biopsy and the needle flush out are always extremely, extremely similar and cluster very closely together. And uh, we went on to try a number of uh, clinical samples from ductal adenocarcinomas, normal samples here, and a number of different um, tumor types that can arise in the pancreas. And the results, again, were very encouraging. But as you can also see, we had some dropouts in the genes that we had selected as well. And at this point, the idea uh, came up to also include microRNAs uh, because they have been reported to be um, very useful in differential diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. And so the idea was uh, to try and uh, create a platform that would include mRNA genes, but also diagnostic microRNAs in a single um, microfluidic card in a 96 gene panel like this. And uh, together with Kai Fu Chen from um, Applied Biosystems, we came up, uh, we produced these cards and we came up with a protocol that allows to, um, in the same aspirate, uh, prepare microRNA and mRNA at the same time, do a um, reverse transcription with a gene-specific primer pool, uh, pre-amplification again uh, with a gene-specific primer pool to only pre-amplify those mRNA and M microRNA genes that we have in the analyses, went through the um, Tecman array analyses. And again, the first thing was the technical validation to see how reliable is this whole procedure? Do we reach um, the necessary sensitivity and is this reproducible? Um, so uh, 
we again uh, prepare the cDNA array pool, test it, uh, replicates with and without preamplification on two different days. And the results, again, were very encouraging. On this side here, um, this is an, a cluster analysis, so samples are clustered according to um, their uh, similarities. And on this side you see that every time when you analyze non-amplified uh, samples, they cluster together and the technical replicates uh, cluster very closely together. Um, these in turn are very similar to their pre-amplified counterparts, so they also cluster together. Um, in the um, in, in this cluster tree, and you can also see that preamplification um, brings out more genes. So genes that are too low expressed uh, to show up in the un uh, unamplified state, then show up in the amplification. This is especially true for uh, many of the microRNA genes. And on this side here, we had a few um, samples, actually aspirate samples from uh, patients, to see if this also works in the real world. And the very first results, uh, very preliminary. Um, here we we are going again for the um, for the first application here, chronic pancreatitis uh, differentiation from ductal adenocarcinomas, and you can see that the majority of adenocarcinomas of the 17 samples uh, that we have tested so far cluster on this side of the tree. The majority of um, pan uh, coronary pancreatitis samples clusters on the other side. This is preliminary and the end result, the end analysis, will of course be much more sophisticated, but it's encouraging. Um, so ongoing now, of course, is a large uh, uh, a profiling of a large number of biopsies of the different types of samples that we want to be able uh, to accurately differentiate, like the cDNA array data showed, possibly even better. And um, as an outlook, uh, what would be very nice for the future, of course, if you could extend this uh, to non-invasive diagnostics. Um, so at the moment, for a fine needle aspirate, the patient has to undergo an invasive procedure. Um, it would be, of course, very preferable if we could do the same thing with simply uh, drawing some blood uh, and uh, um, analyzing circulating tumor cells, and there are reports that are encouraging and that um, that make us think that this will be possible. Another possible source for diagnostic samples is saliva, of course also very easy to collect and uh, completely non-invasive. And um, if this turns out uh, to be effective, then we could uh, actually start thinking about early detection and screening of risk populations of pancreatic cancer because, like I said in the beginning, the early detection of the cancer is the real, um, is the real challenge in diagnostics of pancreatic cancer. And with this, I'd like to thank all the people um, who have contributed in my own group, especially Lisa Fiedler and Ramona Kreider, who did most of the profiling work, um, the colleagues in Marburg, and of course, all the contributors um, from other groups that we're working with nationally and internationally, and of course, the funding organizations without whom all this would not have been possible. And I thank you for your attention. So we have a question coming in that um, asks about how the performance of the TACMAN array card uh, compares to uh, the cDNA arrays that you're obviously uh, using at the very beginning of the research. Right. Um, that is a pretty difficult question to answer. So um, these mixed array Techman cards, we're not through with the final, um, final uh, um, analysis yet, of course. We don't have the final uh, algorithm yet, um, so there's still work going on with that. What we can say is um, that, of course, reproducibility is better. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly better because the cDNA arrays uh, were produced ourselves or by ourselves. Every batch uh, had relatively large uh, variations, so there was a great pain uh, that we had to go through to um, make sure that we normalize these things across different batches. This is not a problem at all with the, with the Techman array cards. And uh, the dynamic range really is higher for the real-time PCR, so we have uh, the difference between a low expressed gene and the high expressed gene that can still be accurately uh, differentiated is much higher for the Techman array cards. Uh, in terms of diagnostic accuracy, um, I can't really say anything yet, uh, but uh, I'm really, really positive about that, yeah. Great, great. 
Okay, um, just looking at some of the other questions, um, how, how large is the contribution of the microRNA genes to the differentiation between diagnostic entities? So uh, I'm guessing uh, in terms of your, your signature that you're looking at, uh, how much of, of the diagnostic power is provided by the microRNAs versus the, the mRNA that you yeah. have? Uh, present, uh, that's a, present a very interesting question, and that's also something that we are very curious to find out. But the, again, there's no definitive answer yet. Um, we'll have to keep in mind that it's only 9 out of uh, 88 genes or 88 uh, uh, features on these um, Tecmin array cards. And uh, um, the differentiation or the, the diagnostic algorithm does not rely on single genes. So we're looking at patterns. And it's uh, relatively hard to really dissect out um, the individual contribution of any gene, mRNA or microRNA. What we can say is uh, that we are reliably able to detect the expression of the microRNAs. And um, we'll have to see if they, if they have a special place in diagnostics. Um, we'll also, of course, look into uh, reducing the set of genes that we're doing the actual diagnostic later or diagnostics later. Um, but um, it's too early to, to give a definitive answer on that. Okay, great. Um, perhaps time just for one last question here. Um, uh, what is uh, the possible impact of any sampling error that you might be seeing within the system? Um, that is a problem, of course, of any um, diagnostic principle that relies on the analysis of small amounts of anything, and especially with um, with. Uh, um, fine needle aspiration, so um, someone has to hit the tumor to aspirate material out of it. Um, we can't guarantee that the person doing the um, aspiration actually really hits the tumor every time, but we do actually have, um, we looked into so-called field effects, so we compared material from the primary tumor itself and surrounding tissue uh, that was not um, not malignantly transformed itself. And uh, we saw that, it, of course, it's different than the tumor itself, um, but it's also different uh, from a simply inflamed tissue. There is inflammation, but the um, expression profiles are different from inflammation in the uh, surrounding of a tumor or pure inflammation in the context of a chronic pancreatitis. Uh, so we are sort of confident that sampling error will hopefully not play so much of a role um, compared to, for example, the cytological analyses. Uh, there, if you miss the tumor, you won't have any, um, um, any transformed cells and then the um, diagnosis will be no sign of malignancy. Um, we're hopeful that we are better than that, um, but we'll have to very carefully look at that. Great. Okay.